Protest action leads to a commitment to address health concerns of post office workers. The region makes an assessment of Brexit's impact on tourism and the jury is out as to how Liat's plans to reduce flight routes will impact the World Creole Music Festival. I am Idona John Baptist with the Channel 5 News. Details after this. Welcome back. Topping the news, staff of the General Post Office downed their tools and left their workstations for the morning, demanding action to what they say are poor working conditions. The strike by the majority of the post office employees lasted for some five hours on Wednesday until the chief personnel officer came to address them. Channel 5 News was on the scene. Well, the purpose we there for is for two main reasons. But the biggest one is our health. Okay? As you're quite aware that it's about three years now, that's about three years now, that building is under construction. Because for the past three years, we have no air condition at the post office. So can you imagine, sorry, you're working in, a, in, a, in an office, in an environment, if no air condition? Can you imagine that? Secondly, the ceiling has to be cleared because I was told that it is asbestos and it can be cancerous. And some of our workers, now hear my voice? Maybe I'm part of it too. Already complaining about our throat, which we assume is their, is their best was doing. Staff say multiple efforts to seek a response by reporting the matter and writing to the powers that be have not yielded results. I've been transferred here from Portsmouth. I'm a postman working at the post office for about 10 years. And I never really had any throat problems, really. And when I went to check my throat since March for, you know, at, at the doctor's office, he told me that I had inflammation and it's probably my diet, eating too late and anything like that. So I decided to change the way I live. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. That's how I eat. I eat my health. It's important to me. And I decided, well, I'm going to change eating late and change other eating, eating habits. And apparently since then, nothing has happened. But since working in that place, and I believe, and I know that the environment working inside here is affecting my voice. Presently, my voice, if I talk too loud, I croak in. And all, all of my upper chest is burning. Vidal laments that their plight has not gotten the level of attention it deserves as public service employees. And we have become the filters in that building. And you to understand that. We have become the filters in the post office. And worse off again, you have tiles that is most likely to be asbestos tile because that post office is an old building. And that building, I understood that the EPA passed certain laws years ago, since 1986, that tiles from that period should not be kept in a building. They should be removed or changed because right now they have non asbestos tiles you can put in a building. And a lot of those tiles get waterlogged. If you go upstairs, you're going to see a set of tiles waterlogged and they have not been removed. A lot of them have broken open. Now, an asbestos tile, once it is broken, once it is punctured, and it goes airborne and gets into your system, it can cause many different harmful effects. Medical doctor Sam Christian agrees that based on the complaints by post office employees, their health is in jeopardy. I have been involved in occupational health and safety in the United States, and we need to elevate our standard to international standards. These men and women who have been serving us in the Postal Service deserve better. A full investigation needs to be made to find out the exact difficulties that they are experiencing. And I have invited each and every one of them who need an independent medical examination to come to my office at Urgent Care and we'll investigate that. I've seen one man already who is hoarse and who may have been affected by the dust and the mold and possibly asbestos. The postmaster general who is seen here in black did not wish to comment when Channel 5 News visited her office during the protest. She did try to reason with her staff about the incident earlier in the morning. Chief Personnel Officer Gloria Joseph, however, seemed to have brought some good news for the employees, causing them to return to work by lunchtime. Joseph told DBS News her meeting with staff was successful and urgent measures will be taken to address issues with the ceiling, ventilation and air conditioning. And there were reports in the local media of protest action at the Isaiah Thomas Secondary on Wednesday. 
Reports say it had to do with a lack of resources. The chief education officer released the following statement. Teachers at the Isaiah Thomas Secondary School met briefly this morning to discuss some concerns that they had about school supplies. Immediately after that brief meeting, they returned to their classrooms and school was back to normal for the rest of the day. And since then, the ministry has addressed their concerns. In other developments, the Caribbean Tourism Organization is working with CARICOM to monitor the impact of Brexit on Caribbean tourism. Based on the CTO's records on tourist arrivals to the region, international tourist trips grew by 7%, accounting for 28.7 million visits. The European market also grew by 4.2%, pointing to 5.2 million visits. The CTO has indicated that in tourist arrivals to the region, the United Kingdom was one of the more dominant performers. A lot of work has been done on both of those issues, uh, and I'll say that there is an excellent collaborative effort between ourselves and CARICOM and others to deal with this issue, so we're not taking it for granted at all. Of the 5.2 million European visited, 1.1 million came from the United Kingdom. That's a 10.4% rise from last year. Newly elected chairman of the Caribbean Tourism Organization and Tourism Minister of the Bahamas is still optimistic about an influx of travel from the United Kingdom. We've not seen um, a decline yet uh, as a result of what took place in um, the UK. The, the truth is the, the numbers seem to be going up. Um, now, what happens um, in the future, we'll have to wait and see. But I believe that um, my view is uh, that travel will continue. One of the things that we're seeing with travel, people still travel. And people are um, notwithstanding all, and we, we know that tourism is the most resilient industry in the entire world. No matter what happens, and we've been through it in the Caribbean, things uh, have a way of turning around. People look for rest, relaxation. Um, people have invested in the Caribbean uh, from the UK um, and uh, they have reasons to come here. So we've not seen the decline. Obviously we're paying attention to it and we're going to have to monitor. We generally believe that it's going to continue to move an upward trend. Barbados is the only Caribbean country which the UK is its number one tourism source market. Clearly the uncertainty is having an impact. The greatest impact that we have felt, obviously, is the plummeting of the value of the pound. Now, that in itself is not new. Barbados, we've always had to live with that. When the UK is your major source market, the pound is fickle, and uh, our dollar is pegged to the US dollar. So we normally live with the fluctuations. Now, it is at a record low, but of course, you never know. It may soon go to a record high. We're still seeing a lot of encouraging signs. The, the commitment uh, from the tour operators, the commitment of airlift, et cetera, is still there. And, um, and, and we're, we're, we're happy about that. Promoters of the World Creole Music Festival are keeping their fingers crossed that Liat will not let them down as they expect a bigger crowd for the October month-end event. A marketing team has been promoting the event in Antigua, St. Martin and the French West Indies. WCMF promoter Leroy Waddix Charles had expressed confidence earlier this month that Liat was going to accommodate passengers to the country for the event. Charles was still hopeful when he addressed the matter at a Dominica Festival's committee news conference on Wednesday. We promoted in Antigua and St. Martin and in relationships and discussions with Liat, they have endorsed the World Creole Music Festival and are a partner in the World Creole Music Festival and will do whatever possible to see to it that if the flights are full, they can even add on more flights. Likewise, Win Air from Antigua and St. Martin and the boss of Win Air promised us over a thousand flights between Canefield, sits that is, sorry, sits between Canefield and Melville Hall for the period of the World Creole Music Festival. But when Channel 5 News informed Charles that Liad had announced it was cutting flights and whether he thought the situation could change, this was his response. Anything from that end will be dealt with by the authorities and they will relate to us any information from, from that point. 
With respect to a Dominican man being arrested for killing a Guadeloupe man in Guadeloupe and the implications that could have on Guadeloupians attending the festival, Charles says he has officially reported the matter to the authorities. A report was compiled and sent to the minister and there were discussions by the government and further response to that will be from the authorities. Well, the report is, is what we saw and what we felt on the ground. We are allowing the situation to be dealt with diplomatically because it's more than just us. So when the authorities give us instructions, we will then relate to the media. Legal practitioners across the Eastern Caribbean have been challenged to make the justice system more accessible and equal to all. The call came from Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Dame Janice Pereira, as she addressed the opening of the new lawyer on Tuesday. Members of the legal profession have a crucial role to play in ensuring effective access to justice by actively pursuing their clients' causes in a timely and efficient manner, by making the best use of resources, and by actively assisting the court in dealing with cases justly. Effective access to justice is not advanced or achieved by engaging in dilatory and deceptive practices. It is the professional responsibility of every legal practitioner to uphold the dignity, respect, and authority of the court at all times. Her ladyship says work is ongoing to enhance the effectiveness of the legal system across the region. In the coming year, the court will continue to strive to ensure that our efforts remain focused on enhancing access to justice so that our responsibility to litigants and the people of our states is realized. That as long as we recognize the importance of human rights, then there must be in place systems to guarantee a platform on which these rights can find redress should they be trampled upon. If there is no recourse through justice by which a person who has been aggrieved can find redress, then one would ask, what is the use of being afforded human rights? Governments across the OECS member states were reminded of their responsibility to the judicial system in the region. It is the state's and territory's responsibility to provide adequate financial resources to the judiciary. Why then, I ask, that nearly 50 years on, very little has been done in addressing the needs of the judiciary in our region. For far too long, the judiciary has been made to make do with precious little, while at the same time, the citizenry hold great expectations as they should. It is also the state's responsibility to provide adequate resources to those who are tasked with the detection, investigation, and prosecution of crimes. You're watching Channel 5 News. Coming up, local restaurant bounces back after devastating fire. Stay with us. Thanks for staying tuned. No word yet on how Liat's decision to cut back routes will impact Dominica flights as the Antigua-based airline restructures. Liat will reduce flights across its 18 destinations in a bid to make its operations more profitable. Liat's acting CEO says a change from the Dash 8 aircraft to ATR aircraft two years ago has also left the airline with fewer planes making it difficult to serve all existing routes. Since in the past, we had as many as 18 dash eights, so we're down to nine aircraft. There are some decisions that have been taken already, and presumably there will be others taken, where we eliminate routes because they're not as profitable as we would like them to be. This is not the first time the Antigua-based airline has made a decision to cut flights. It took a similar decision in 2014 and is no longer flying to Santo Domingo and Curaçao. 
Rafa Jones could only say that the Grenada to St. Vincent route would be affected. Liat's Chief Commercial Officer Lloyd Caswell said other routes likely to be affected will depend on an ongoing review of the Liat network. That process with the network review is now coming close to an end in the next few weeks and we'll be looking at a top level document in the next, in the next six weeks. The Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute, CARDI, is seeking to build sustainability and resilience in Dominica's farming sector. A recent one-day training exercise held in Laplane helped expose farmers, students and technicians to traditional knowledge and innovative practices which contribute to the development of sustainable and resilient farms. Those of you who were raised in a farm family and you can recall the days of your parents practicing agriculture in a very sustainable manner. How did they maintain soil fertility? How did they maintain soil improvement? What organic matter meant to them? How did they control pest and disease? How did they manage all these things without having to spend so much money as we spend today? How did they use the moon phase, interestingly? And you see, when we look at what we call traditional knowledge, there is this tendency to, of those of us who are trained scientifically to brush it aside. Leslie wants to see the agricultural practices of our forefathers revisited. So it's not a matter of reinventing the wheel, but it's to revisit what the practices of our forefathers as it relates to agriculture and agricultural sustainability. He believes it's critical to replenish the soil, especially in light of climate change and its impact. How do we treat the soil? One writer says that the soil is like a bank. And if you have your bank account and you keep taking from your bank account and not replacing to this bank account, you deplete your bank account. Just imagine every time you put a plant in the ground and you harvest from that plant, you may be looking at the fruit, but we should begin to look at the biomass, meaning everything that is taken from that soil into that plant for human life. Mm, for animal life. But we always think, what do we put back on the practices that we should implement to put back something into the soil to sustain the soil at a level of fertility so that we can continue to produce not only for ourselves, but for our children and coming generations. Topics covered during the training include sustainable land preparation practices, soil health, pest management, farm waste management, and climate resilience. The classroom and field training was funded under the 10th European Development Fund under the Agriculture Policy Programme Caribbean Action. In other news, government is putting specific measures and policies in place to accommodate public officers from Petit Savan affected by Tropical Storm Erica. Chairman of the Dominica Housing Loans Board, Felix Thomas, says following Tropical Storm Erica, a decision was taken to waive all loan and interest payments of affected borrowers. Thomas says the payments were only reinstated after their job situation was settled. I believe that the government housing revolution program, which we are part of, you know, um, is a well-fought, well-designed, you know, operation to ensure that um, governments in its, in its housing frost can assist many other Dominicans to, to house themselves. Whilst the Government Housing Loans Board is just an aspect of that, dealing with public officers in terms of persons who are employed, persons who are able to contract loans, that we want to complement the efforts made by the um, Roosevelt Scarlett, you know, led administration and we want to compliment and thank the Honourable Prime Minister very, very much for the assistance and the cooperation, you know, that he have um, granted to the um, 
government housing loans board. Thomas says managing a mortgage facility is far more difficult than managing a banking institution. He explained that there are no deposits as the case at banks, which means that the board has to locate sources of funding. And less than three weeks after a devastating fire put an eating establishment out of commission, it's now business as usual for the Italia restaurant. On the evening of Thursday, 18th August, an electrical fire gutted the insides of the Italia restaurant, rendering it inoperable and putting eight employees out of a job. However, two weeks and $60,000 later, it is back to business at this restaurant. So I want to thank God for bringing us back at Italia restaurant. Even it's better than how it was and new, better customers. And, and to thank my boss man and his wife for giving them the courage and strength to have us once again at Italia restaurants. Oh, it feels very good. Mr. Foy is a very hardworking man, very encouraging. And um, along with the, the co-workers, we all came together and said, well, we yeah, there's a will, there's a way, and we made it. And you can see how the big change that came from, a little, few little changes. But it, it said that in everything, give thanks. So we gave thanks for, give thanks for what is, what we did, and how far we have come. Thank God for that. Because if it wasn't for Him, for God, if it wasn't for His mercies, His love, we wouldn't have been there today. It could have been worse. So I want to thank God for bringing us back at Italia. I want to thank our customers. I want to thank my workers, uh, some very good workers. And I want to thank them also. Owner of Italia Restaurant told Channel 5 News that he has and will be putting in new measures to safeguard his restaurant from future incidents. It's much better than you know it was before. And I think it's, it's even more properly less ventilated in terms of the cooling system. And then we did some additional work, especially the, um, we have what you call a new electrical system now. You know, it's more a modern electrical system. The fire department was there recently. I need to put in some fire extinguishers in the place and maybe other mechanisms, you know, some safety mechanism if something like that would occur. And it would occur, you know, while the workers are at work or the people inside of the building. You know, there are other things I think um, they would have to recommend to me. And personally, I'm telling you, I'm going to make sure that I implement those um, measures. From one business owner to the other, Foy says proprietors must be more mindful of the electrical wiring of their buildings as human health and safety are of utmost importance. After a certain time, you need to reassess, you know, what you have. And then if you see, you know, the electrical system is weak. And then the other thing again, we keep on adding. We keep on adding, but not knowing that we are putting more load onto a very, let's say, older system. That is why I would encourage, you know, other business owners, you know, you have workers at your, at your workplace, you have to ensure that they, uh, they, there's the safety, safety mechanism in place so that, you know, something occurs, you know, that you don't have no injuries or no loss of life or nothing. That's news. Kenny Williams is next with your sports highlights. In cricket, one former WICB executive believes the use of a foreign coach could help improve the Windies cricket product. This according to former WICB CEO, Dr. Donald Peters. Uh, the West Indies need to get a foreign coach. Players do not play well for local coaches. We, we met with players, but we look at their numbers from the time they started playing, and we could see their weaknesses and their strengths. That's what we have to do. Instead of saying that one bad, that one good, let's look at what the numbers say. He says running a cricket business is not a difficult task and the interference of outside influences is not necessary. What member are going to volunteer to cut themselves? There are two members representing each territory. The, um, all the recommendations have said that well, it should only be one. <laughs> so, this is the rhetorical question. Who's going to do that? So we have to get practical uh, and, um, and trying to dissolve West Indies board by government agencies is also another ridiculous um, concept. <laughs> not, 
it's not that important. West Indies cricket is a franchise of players. Represent. I mean, we still have um, embrace it as a definition of our culture, but it's still cricket, and um, it doesn't take carry come to run West Indies cricket. I mean, I can run West Indies cricket on my own, and so can you. All you need. I mean, it's just a company um, running a sports franchise. What is so complicated about that? Why is it so emotional? So, um, and for governments to be involved in this, and it's, it's a lot of drama. So uh, my answer to it is get the right people to run the, the institution and, and they'll be fine. Next up, plans are in the pipeline to further develop Benjamins Park into a complete multi-sports complex soon. This according to Portsmouth MP Ian Douglas. We want the Benjamins Park to really continue to remain a community park where persons can just come at any time, night or day. And now we have invested in the lighting of the football field. The, the, the ultimate vision is to light up the entire park eventually. Even the cricket area, the basketball area is lighted already. When we do the tennis courts and the netball court, that will also be lighted. So our, to answer your question directly, we don't want to fence the park. So to be able to charge persons like Windsor Park to enter the park. What we want to do is build, continue to build a series of stands around the park. So ultimately and eventually, the park will be surrounded by stands. You'll have the football stands, you have some of the cricket stands that are already there. Of course, you can see the basketball stands that are already there. We're going to do some washrooms. It is our ultimate vision to be able to do a covering over the basketball, the netball, and the tennis courts so that we know we have a sort of semi-enclosure, but not a place that you can lock and keep people away from and charge them a fee to enter. That is not the... That is not the plan. He says the plan is to have multiple sporting activities happening simultaneously. Benjamin's Park can actually house all of the different sporting disciplines and they can actually be happening at the same time without interfering with each other. So you can play rounders in the western end, the cricketers, without going onto the cricket boundary, the cricketers can be running a cricket game right there. The footballers can play because the cricket boundaries do not necessarily run onto the football pitch and you can have a basketball game going on right there and hopefully before the end of the year into next year you can have a netball game happening all at the same time at the Benjamin Spa. Nice and easy. On to court sports now where local volleyballers will soon start training for the second round of the World Cup qualifiers carded for April 2017. The Dominica Volleyball Association reported the men's team will be coached by Jeffrey Edmund and assisted by Ericsson Liblan who recently completed a formal coaches course in Hungary. Coach Liblan will also assist head coach Albert Loblak for the women. Training days are set for Monday at 6 p.m. Wednesday and Friday at 5 p.m. for the men. The women will train on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 3 and 5 p.m. on Saturdays. The male and female teams will be selected towards the end of the six-month training period. That's all the sporting highlights for now. I am Kenny Williams. We'll see you in the next one. It's time now for Flashback. Welcome to another edition of Flashback. And today we're putting special emphasis on the community of Bagatelle, where in 1977, that's 39 years ago, 13 people lost their lives in a major landslide. Here's the clip. In the mid-morning hours of September 21st, 1977, the village of Bagatelle experienced a landslide that would forever change the face of that southeastern community. Angelina Martin, a teacher at the Bagatelle school, was swept away by the waves of soil. She recounts the experience. The day really started with a lot of rain and um, a neighbor of ours called for help because she said water was flooding her home. So we went over to her area to help. And then a little while later, we just suddenly heard a loud noise. It comes small by small. It comes cheap, 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 small by small. But what are the uh, oven? There was baking bread in the, in the oven. And everybody coming. Uh, I'm a lady from Cadbois. They call me only. He tell them, to come out there. They've been going down. They didn't believe that. And they just boom. But that, that dam was full of water. and. It, that, that dam got, got broken and I didn't talk to him and he, he pushed more water and he pushed everything down. So we saw a lot of dead people they take from uh, under the soil 
and they started to watch them, looking for people, they didn't find people. My mother also died in that disaster, and um, from that time on, I'm kind of living on my own, you know. I am standing now next to the memorial in memory of the 13 individuals who lost their lives in this community some 39 years ago. The names are here. You have Alford Fontaine, George Joseph, uh, as Ruta Thomas, uh, Blaise Thomas, Aranthea Thomas, uh, Marsley Thomas, Anastasi Martin, Kevin Deshangol, Deborah Thomas, Delbert Alexander, Colbert Bethelme, Gerard Fontaine and Ahmad Fontaine. Quite a number, I noticed quite a number of um, Fontaines there, about three so far, I think I counted in this list. So, as we remember uh, these people, uh, it's uh, also in order that we bear in mind as well that not too far from this community in Petit Savan, just last year, we lost a number of lives there as well in that major tragedy. So, thank you for joining us for this uh, look back in history on Flashback. We'll see you next week. Coming up, the weather report. Good evening and welcome to tonight's weather broadcast. I am your presenter, Annie Coretta Joseph. We start off this evening by taking a look at some earlier satellite imagery. And of interest is this area of low pressure associated with tropical depression, Carla, currently moving west-northwestly at 9 miles per hour. Visible satellite imagery showed a few low-level clouds over Dominica throughout the course of the day. Radar imagery indicated some widely scattered showers over the Lesser Antilles. Conditions for tonight fear to partly cloudy with some brief scattered showers. Tomorrow, partly cloudy with some scattered showers. Sea conditions slight to moderate in open water with waves up to 5 feet. Taking a look at the extended forecast, weak and stable conditions will continue to dominate conditions throughout the remainder of the week, resulting in fear to partly cloudy skies with some scattered showers. And across the region tomorrow, partly cloudy skies with some scattered showers can be expected throughout the Lesser Antilles. On the international scene, partly cloudy skies in New York and London, some thunderstorm in Miami and Caracas, and clear skies in Beijing. The sun will rise tomorrow at 5.54 a.m. and set at 6.01 p.m. For up-to-date information, log on to our website at weather.gov.dm or call the weather hotline at 447-5555. Thank you for viewing and join us next time. Good night. And a reminder of the headlines, protest action leads to a commitment to address health concerns of post office workers, the region makes an assessment of Brexit's impact on tourism, and the jury is out as to how Liat's plans to reduce flight routes will impact the World Creole Music Festival. Feel free to contact us at news at marpin2k4.com. You can also access our past newscasts on our YouTube channel. On behalf of the production team, I am Idona John Baptist, and to all our viewers around the world, Thanks for watching. Join us tomorrow.